Welcome to the New America Foundation and the Open Technology Institute. I'm Rebecca McKinnon. I'm director of the Ranking Digital Rights Program affiliated with OTI. And I'm just going to introduce briefly and, and then hand it over to the experts here. Um, just wanted to say, I mean, this panel today is the culmin culmination or I, I guess a milestone of a real evolution um, in not only sort of export control policy, but in policy thinking around internet freedom generally. Um, and we've seen the thinking and the understanding of the issues get a lot more sophisticated over the past decades since I started working on internet freedom and advocacy issues. We sort of started out, I think, particularly amongst policymakers and in the media with kind of an attitude that, well, you know, the good guys will route around the bad guys eventually. So just put a lot of technology out there and it'll all sort itself out. And then I, then that kind of evolved into, okay, we need to help arm the good guys a little better. So get more circumvention and anti-surveillance tools out there to the good guys so that they can fight the bad guys more f effectively. And and then I, we've, we've kind of moved on in the mainstream policy discourse to a recognition that internet freedom starts at home. And not only do we need to get our houses in order in the democratic democratic world um, uh, to, to really practice what we preach, uh, but also recognizing that uh, corporations based in North America and Western Europe, uh, in some cases, um, might be incentivized through other means to behave more responsibly. But there are other companies that are basically arms dealers. Uh, and they're selling technologies that are empowering bad people. Uh, and and that are contributing to an, an internet that is not human rights compatible in much of the world, and that something very concrete needs to be done. And so there, I think, is coming to be a more, I mean, there's always been a community of people working on export uh, control reform, uh, but, but I think <laughs> that there's a lot more kind of high level serious attention coming to it now. And what's really important, um, with this panel is is recognition that solutions are as complicated as the technologies that they relate to um, and as complicated as the global economic uh, patterns of, of trade and economics and as complicated as the very complex geopolitical landscape that we're facing today and that that they're not sort of simple quick and dirty solutions uh, and I think what we've also really learned is the importance of research and fact-based policymaking and, and really drawing upon expertise. And, and uh, my colleague, Tim Mara, will introduce our, our panel, uh, which really represents uh, the New America Foundation, OTI, Human Rights Watch, which has also being do, been doing some really great research in this space to contribute to our understanding of what the facts are, what the problem really looks like, so that we can have real-world solutions, and Colin Anderson, an independent technology ana analyst who has really been working on these issues, and, and, and a politician, Maricha, who, who uh, has uh, really been drawing upon the good work and really working with civil society and with the research community to develop a fact-based policy, and, uh, and that, that's very important as well, that, that all of that circle be connected. And so with that, I'll hand it over to my colleague, Tim Marr, who will introduce people a bit more formally. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Rebecca. Thank you all for coming today to this event. Um, and many thanks to all the panelists here for joining us uh, today here at the New America Foundation. Um, I'd like to introduce um, first Maricha Schake, um, who is a member of the European Parliament and is currently visiting Washington, DC. Um, Maricha has been in the parliament since 2009 and has focused on digital freedom from um, the start and has actually um, been one of the leading brains behind this in the parliament. She's, member, she's a member of the Committee on Foreign Affairs as well as on the Committee of International Trade in the uh, European Parliament. And in addition to her interest in tech policy, has an extensive uh, experience in the United States, having studied here as well as having been a Lantos Fellow in the House of Representatives. So it's a particular pleasure to have Maricha here uh, with us today. Um, with this event, which will also serve to launch the re uh, new report that we published today that I hope you were all able to pick up a copy outside. And um, I'd like next to, I would like to introduce next um, Arvind Ganeshan from, hu from Human Rights Watch. He leads the Business and Human Rights Unit at Human Rights Watch. 
has an extensive experience with regard to freedom of expression, sanctions. Uh, he was one of the founding members of um, GNI, the Global Network Initiative. Uh, he was the founder of the Principles on Security and Human Rights uh, with regard to oil, gas, um, and the extractive industries. And his work has covered many countries. And um, we're particularly pleased to have him here today um, because Human Rights Watch is going to launch a new report tomorrow, which is titled, They Know Everything We Do, Telecom and Internet Surveillance in Ethiopia. Um, the report launch will take place in Berlin, but I'm sure there will be lots of news coverage um, for those of you who are interested to follow that as well. And with that, I'd like to uh, introduce Colin Anderson, um, who is an independent researcher, as Rebecca already mentioned. And Colin has done some really interesting and groundbreaking research in many ways, looking at the internet and using internet data to look into topic, uh, issues such as censorship with a specific focus on Iran. Um, and he is one of the few people uh, that I know who uh, can speak both tech and policy um, fluently, and policy including export control regulations, which uh, with those of you who are here who do this on a daily basis know and appreciate how uh, challenging that can be from time to time. Um, so with that, um, we will start out by actually focusing on what is the problem and what is the impact of um, surveillance technology around the world and for people. And Arvind is going to start with that. And uh, we will then move over to look at some of the policy options that are available, namely export controls, and try to shed light on what has been happening both in Europe, which Maricha will speak about, and then uh, the US, which is where I will speak a little bit more about the report that we launched today, and uh, Colin can also add to what has been happening in the U.S. in recent months and years. So with that, thanks again, and Maritza, uh, sorry, not Maritza, but Arvind, <laughs> if you want to kick us off. Uh, sure. Well, thank you, everybody, for coming, and thanks for allowing me to participate today. What I thought I would do is just briefly describe the human rights issues that are related to export controls and technology, and then turn it over to everybody else. Um, so basically, if from, from a human rights perspective, we look at the internet and telephone communications and other types of technology as, as a medium for free expression and as an area where privacy needs to be protected. So increasingly in today's world, the internet, mobile telephones, and other things are the principal way people communicate. And it's what allows everybody to become a human rights activist, to mobilize and, and organize. That's, that's just where technology is taken us. But at the same time, those are the tools that many governments don't like. And so increasingly we're seeing censorship around the world through these technologies. And we're seeing, not least of which in the United States, use of these technologies as the backbone for surveillance in a number of circumstances. And as a result of that, it, it creates a multi-level problem. There's the traditional human rights problem of what a government does, which is something the human rights community has been dealing with for decades. There is the second level problem, which is these are largely private sector creations, so they're m as influenced by how the private sector behaves as they may be by how, what a government does. And then finally is the critical issue, which is as a matter of principle, we would like to see everybody have access to these technologies. So the solution cannot be to ban them per se, but rather to spread them in a way that respects human rights. So, so this is the multi-level problem we're facing. Now within that, the way we think about technology is kind of, uh, there's, this, there's the services side, which is what you do online, <coughs> the Googles, the Facebooks, Twitters, and things like that. Then there's the backbone side, which is the internet infrastructure, the mobile telephony infrastructure, Structure that allows people to communicate. And then there is another subset altogether, which is a specific set of technologies that allows principally governments to spy and censor on people. Um, and these, this last set, which has been uh, a key focus of a number of people's work up here, came to light largely during the Arab uprisings around the world when it was, when it was discovered that one, a number of governments like Libya, Syria, and, and Iran had been using these technologies to censor or spy on, on individuals within the country. More problematic is that much of the technology developed in the West, and even more problematic is it's exported almost virtually unregulated. And there's a fundamental problem that's created by this, and that is that, number one, there is such technology out there that could be used for legitimate law enforcement or intelligence purposes, but probably won't be for two reasons. One is 
you can only sell to a government once, and then you have to find another government customer. And not every government is going to respect the rule of law or people's rights when they buy this technology. And two, it's inherently problematic because it's set up to spy and to censor. So it's in that context where we confront the issue of export controls, and I'll stop briefly and turn it over to others about what's being done. But I, you understand the problem here is, one, there's technology that exists that isn't going anywhere. Two, there's an imperative to see more and more people have access to certain types of technology to exercise free expression and to be able to do it in a way that they know their privacy won't be violated. And three, there are a number of companies out there that are selling things in an unregulated fashion. And then four, there are a number of governments who love this technology because it gives them a window of insight into their citizens that they may never have had before. So with that, I will turn it over to the others um, to talk about some of the specifics about how these issues issues are being addressed. Great. Thanks a lot. Marichu, in December 2012, you were one of the uh, early vocal voices about this topic, and you uh, pointed out that this is also unregulated, and you uh, pushed, put out a call for the EU to do something. Could you tell us a little bit more what made you aware of the problem in the first place and what has happened since? Yes. Uh, thank you. It's a great pleasure to be here. I want to uh, specifically thank the New America Foundation, but also different partners who have really shown great leadership in this field from early on, assembled people, uh, and uh, congrat congratulate you all with the report that came out today. I really think it's a milestone. It's going to be very important. I haven't read it yet, but I know a little bit of the work that went into it. Um, and beyond research, uh, to be such an active voice in the public debate, which I think is very much needed also in this topic. So that's why I very much welcome this discussion, which is very technical but very relevant. So I'll try my best to break it down to um, uh, understandable terms. Um, a little bit of how I stumbled upon this topic. Um, when I was elected in 2009, uh, it was not just Europeans electing the European Parliament, there were also Iranians trying to elect a president. And uh, after the outcome did not seem to reflect their votes, many of them took to the streets and asked, where is my vote? And we saw <coughs> the now famous green uh, movement uh, expressing itself, but also being uh, shut down fairly effectively and without much violence uh, in hindsight if we look at what later happened and continues to happen in countries like Syria. Um, but looking a little bit more deeply into what happened in Iran, it was very clear that technology played a key role in both, as Arvin said, advancing people's ability to access information, to organize, to mobilize, uh, to share human rights abuses that were documented on mobile phones and uh, instantly known to the rest of the world. But it was also very clear uh, and became increasingly clear mostly because of the very valuable work of investigative journalists that uh, indeed Western technology could it, it immediately be traced back to individuals who had been uh, dragged from their homes, put into prisons, uh, after they, for example, turned on their phone after having had it off for three months, four months. Uh, it was clear in raids that laptops were uh, the most interesting uh, object to seize from, from activists, um, et cetera, et cetera. So it was very clear that technology played uh, a potential role for good and a potential role for bad, and that is why uh, I started to look more deeply into that. And of course, this discussion remains relevant until today, uh, but has been in all of the uprisings, um, uh, whether we look today in, in the Ukraine and Crimea or whether we looked at Tunisia, um, uh, the world over, we see that there is a real struggle here. And I think the first sentence of this a uh, new report says, uh, says it all by just saying that the value of this industry, of the surveillance industry, went from virtually zero to around $5 billion a year. Um, and what that, what that indicates is not only that it's a thriving industry, uh, it also shows that the interests and the stakes are increasingly high. Uh, while we know that the impact on human rights, but also on our own strategic interests, and I think that should not be forgotten, uh, are also increasingly high. And all of this, the sprawling and proliferation of this industry and these technologies, are happening in a regulatory vacuum. Uh, when I look at the European side, there's virtually no transparency about what this market really is. All that we know, we know through the very, very valuable work of Privacy International and other um, NGOs. And as a result of a lack of transparency, there's virtually no accountability, uh, while the technologies that allow for surveillance, hacking, tracking, tracing, and monitoring are uh, proliferating and getting faster, cheaper, and smaller every day. 
And so it's kind of ironic, I'm a member of the European Parliament, and for those of you who don't follow European politics uh, on a daily basis, we are often accused of regulating everything, over-regulating everything, from the height of, of ladders that window uh, washers are allowed to stand on to water or uh, children's toys. And so it's somewhat ironic that there is hardly any regulation here. And uh, from experience, I can tell it's very, very difficult to get the regulation moving uh, at all. And the reason is that the, the member states and states in general are major players in this market. Uh, I think that has to be <coughs> a, a part of this discussion that um, uh, the incentives to regulate uh, by states are probably hampered by the incentives to purchase uh, on this market. Um, in the EU, we have some more problems. That is, one, that the existing policies are still very fragmented. So different member states have different rules. And, uh, for example, we decide on sanctions uh, on an EU level, but then the enforcement of sanctions happens on the member state level. That means 28 different eyes um, enforcing one law. Um, and um, all this uh, kind of gives a patchwork of regulations that do impact uh, the export of surveillance technologies somewhat. Uh, I briefly mentioned sanctions. Uh, it's the only area where we really have regulation uh, in sanctions when it comes to Iran or Syria. Uh, it is now forbidden to sell technologies that can be used for internal repression. But uh, when it's also forbidden to, uh, to sell food uh, or to transport any goods to a country, that's hardly surprising. So it's, it's on the one hand explicit because we pushed very hard to reference it uh, in these sanctions. On the other hand, it comes in a total package and it's at a great gap uh, with countries that are not so far uh, like, for example, Bahrain or uh, Azerbaijan or Ethiopia where uh, people are similarly repressed, where uh, these goods are actually sold without any regulation. So that gap, I believe, creates uh, hypocrisy and uh, undermines our credibility. Um, we've sought to use the dual-use regulation uh, and its update to, to address some of these problems, because really where to put the impact of these surveillance tools is still a question that uh, remains to be answered. Um, the dual-use regulation in, in Europe uh, stems from seeking to control the export of technologies that are potentially used in, for example, nuclear plants, and that in that sense uh, should be regulated. Uh, but that could also be used in a simple uh, water uh, clearing facility without doing harm. So there are extra checks before these dual-use uh, items can be sold, depending on which country they are sold to. Um, and I think that that is um, uh, a hint at where we have to go with regulating uh, surveillance technology and its export, which is to look at, on the one hand, what the technologies are capable of, but more specifically at the context within which they're going to be used, and then regulate through the transactional part, so really through the trade part. To know what these technologies do, we often don't have to look far. Uh, companies market very effectively how you don't need to torture people, but you can actually use their technologies to extract information from people, how you can find needles in haystacks. And, uh, well, the, the list is long and often quite um, uh, creative uh, and amusing if it wasn't so dead serious what we're dealing with here. So I would invite you all to look at, uh, for example, Privacy International's database of um, of what these technologies do. Um, we should also show leadership by reassessing our own standards. Um, EU regulation demands that telecom networks, for example, have lawful intercept capabilities. And while the word lawful intercept reveals the intention uh, of these back doors, uh, we don't have to uh, have to uh, be rocket scientists to understand what happens to these technologies when they're put in a context where the rule of law does not exist. It sort of eliminates uh, the notion of lawfulness. Uh, nevertheless, uh, these standards apply also to exported goods. And I think we should show leadership by having a deeper discussion about what it means to be a democracy in a hyper-connected world. That discussion should probably take place in this city <laughs> more than anywhere else, but I won't go into that more, more deeply today. Just uh, a few more comments and then I'll end, because uh, I'm more interested in the 
discussion with you, there has been a lot of criticism and uh, skepticism, I should say, especially from the tech community, uh, about how to regulate technology. And I understand this. It is very difficult to get it right, and it is a sensitive issue. There are traumas, one could say, from the uh, crypto wars, and uh, there are a lot of people who say that one cannot ever regulate speech, and that that includes software. Um, but as Rebecca, I think, rightfully mentioned, some of these companies are really modern day arms dealers. And so, in my opinion, the status quo is unacceptable. And by criticizing every potential <laughs> regulation, we're not getting much further. So I think we have to be able to find a way to get this right. And uh, as I mentioned, I believe the focus should be on the trade part of things, so the transaction between um, companies and buyers who are often states or uh, law enforcement agencies there. And in between those two, you can, for example, put a licensing requirement where it's clear for companies and governments alike what is being traded, what the capacities are, and whether this is in accordance with the law or not. And this transparency would really add a lot already uh, and is lacking right now. Um, and in the European context, but I won't bore you too much with that, it would really be helpful if there is uh, a level playing field between the states uh, so that we don't have 28 different systems. Um, while some decisions are made on the EU level, the um, implementation happens on the member state level. This leads to a lack of a level playing field, but also uh, I think it's better to do the oversight and the regulation on the European level to avoid a conflict of interest. Um, for those of you who, who uh, know what, what uh, ministries of the economy or trade ministries usually do, it's they go on trade missions to third countries with national companies. And it's, it's not a great incentive to then have to uh, regulate the same companies, basically, uh, to ensure that, that dual use regulations are met or licensing requirements are met. It's better to do that with a little bit more distance. So in all this, I don't think we have to reinvent the wheel. Uh, we can learn a lot from existing um, export controls, such as uh, weapon embargoes, such as uh, licensing requirements. Um, and uh, uh, I hope and I think it is possible with um, more information and with a vibrant public debate to get relevant and unharmful, but adequate regulation in place. Great. Thanks a lot, Maricha. Um, Colin, do you want to say a little bit about the U.S. context and what technologies we're talking about? Yeah. Um, so I want to really pick up on Maricha's point about uh, decisions being made that strongly interact with strategic interests, but happening in a vacuum with little due, due diligence. And I want to do so in, in the context of the United States. I think that this is a particularly interesting point, given that the flow of technologies that have the ability to, say, for example, interfere with democratic movements or inter, uh, interfere with religious minorities' abilities to practice have strong implications w for existing policies. These things interact with their, the United States' strategic ob objectives as well as moral obligations. If you look, for example, in the case of of Egypt or Iran, both of which had provisioned telecommunications intercept equipment by EU and American companies, these are instances in which very quickly the, uh, the foreign policy considerations of, of the host states changed in the midst of it. The nature of these telecommunications uh, equipment is you ship once and it is therefore a permanent part of the surveillance state. You can't take that back. And so this is, a, this is an export that has uh, particular implications over the long term. Um, so I, I, think that, I think that what you've seen is this gradual growing of controls, but, but failures. This is not, the Wassenaar changes are not the first, the first step in, in export controls. Uh, in fact, you have, for example, the surreptitious listening uh, controls in 2006, which were put in place primarily to prevent uh, terrorist organizations or unlawful uh, interceptions of, 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 of communications over, over the wire. These things never quite interacted with, for example, uh, internet communications intercepting equipment. You also saw in 2002 and then implemented in 2013 
the regulation of MC catchers. MC catchers are, uh, are equipment that are, are capable of, for example, pulling information off of cell phone devices by uh, mirroring being a, a cell phone base station. And so these, these things are, are all sort of in the natural is interest of the United States to regulate the export of, not necessarily pr to prohibit, but to require due diligence on the, the foreign availability. And so why is this? If you take, for example, the countries that are designated under the International Religious Freedom Act as countries of particular concern, if we look at it, actually, of the eight countries that are, are, are CPCs, uh, two of which have been provided uh, U.S. Uh, surveillance or, 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 or surreptitious listening devices equipment, five of them Western in total. So if we take, for example, Saudi Arabia, which is a CPC, uh, Saudi Arabia has been proven by external, uh, external research. There's no disclosure process, and so this is, this is, we know about this through the work of, of organizations such as Citizen Lab, the Electronic Frontier Foundation, or Privacy International. Um, we know, for example, that Citizen Lab was provisioned Noros devices, uh, which are uh, intelligence equipment for telecommunications traffic, tra uh, telecommunications traffic. Uh, malware or spyware from hacking team, uh, network equipment useful for uh, uh, censorship purposes by Blue Coat, uh, more surveillance equipment by Trovacor, and more censorship equipment by Smart Filter. Uh, three of those, Norris, Blue Coat, and Smart Filters, are manufactured by American companies. Uh, Norris also, uh, so if, if we take also the 2013 recommendations for additional uh, uh, country listings for CPCs, uh, out, of, out of the seven that they recommended, three of which were provisioned uh, equipment by American companies, and six of which uh, American Euro and European and also Canada Canadian companies. And so if we look at this list, we find that actually these states that we have significant concerns are engaging in, in the rep uh, repression of religious practices. Uh, the majority of these countries have been given technology that is actually significantly useful for repressing these, uh, these uh, religious practices. So this is, for one, a moral objective. If we see, for example, however, um, in the case of, of the UAE, uh, the UAE, there are, are instances in which uh, American-made malware was pushed to uh, American Black or to BlackBerry devices. This is a case again, then where the business interests of the United States uh, align with the, the strategic uh, objectives of export controls. Uh, finally, you know the problem is 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 that while there's this been this regulation under the surreptitious listening device, it's it's not clear whether existing regulation has applied. If we take, for example, the case of, of IP Fabrics, that's a network intelligence equipment manufacturer. IP fab Fabrics was found or disclosed to have engaged in, in practices uh, that attempted to basically whitewash what they were. According to allegations from the CEO, who was later pushed out because he attempted to classify his equipment as surreptitious listening devices, uh, when the CEO became, became, uh, came to believe, his holding company attempted to dis de delay disclosure to the Department of Commerce and conceal foreign customers. He then pressured the, they then pressured the CEO to rename the product and apply under a more lax uh, export control number as well as misdescribe the, the uh, use of their powerful sur uh, surveillance devices. And so if we see, we see this uh, basically exactly what you spoke to. Uh, equipment that have significant uh, strategic and moral ramifications for the United States as well as, as Europe uh, being exported in a vacuum. And these, again, like I say, these are permanent de decisions. Uh, the Nokia Siemens networks devices that were, were pushed to Iran will always be in Iran. They will not be turned off. And so future democratic participation, future democratic movements will always be subject uh, to this, this one export decision. Thank you, Colin, um, which is a great uh, transition to the situation that we found ourselves in when we started looking into this about a year ago now, I think, we, when we started having first conversations about this, um, that over the past few years, there's been an increase in recognition that this is a problem, and that in many ways it's a problem that did not exist before in terms of the technology that exists and the scale um, at which this is happening and the new market that has emerged. Um, so you had... Um, 
investigative journalist. You had researchers at the Citizen Lab uh, writing and publishing reports about what kind of technology are we talking about and what kind of country, what kind of countries uh, should we be concerned of. Um, very few people did the next step in terms of what kind of policy analysis um, is needed to actually think about what kind of solution could we implement. And the expo control um, piece being one of the options that you uh, that we um, looked into uh, further. And the challenge was, we know that this is a p potential policy option, but it's actually really hard to find out how to implement this effectively and in a way that it actually makes sense. Um, and that's when we teamed up with Privacy International in the United Kim Kingdom and a German NGO called Digitale Gesellschaft um, and engaged in a joint project, and this report is the culmination of this, of this project, to conduct uh, in-depth policy and technical analysis of what are we actually talking about, what kind of precedents exist in the expo control regimes in all three countries with regard to human rights, with regard to uh, surveillance technology, and to summarize that in this report. Um, the idea was also that um, we had to do this jointly with uh, organizations in other countries because an expo control regime is um, only effective if it's done across the board with different countries on board. Um, there's ar uh, obviously the argument to be made that even unilateral controls make sense if you want to align your expo control regime with your foreign policy that's pr uh, based on human rights and that promotes human rights. And that if you're interested in making sure that you're not pursuing a hypocritical foreign policy, you need to make sure that you have controls in place um, so that your own uh, foreign policy is in line with um, uh, your export control policies in line with what you're uh, preaching while you're abro abroad. Um, so this report outlines an analysis of these three export control regimes. What then happened in December was that the Vasna regime, which is a multilateral export control regime um, that currently consists of 41 member states, uh, including all of the EU members except for Cyprus, um, but also um, countries in South America and Asia, and this expo control regime, which was um, set up to focus both on arms and dual use technology, adopted two new controls relating to surveillance technology in December, one relating to intrusion software and one uh, relating to IP network surveillance systems. And these two new controls were adopted in December by all 41 states and now need to be implemented by these governments in the 41 countries. Um, they therefore open a window of opportunity to show that governments are taking this problem seriously and to think about how they can actually implement these controls. And Bosnar is a regime that focuses on regional and international security and stability. So it's not a regime that focuses on human rights as such. Um, but as we hope this report shows is that there are precedents in the export control regimes in the three countries um, that provide a precedent to implement human rights provision into the changes um, that are necessary to implement the Vasna changes as well. And there are a number of different options that are available, um, which we don't go into greater depth in the report. The report is meant to provide an overview of the three regimes, the Vasna regime, um, the EU level, because that's particularly important for the UK and Germany, and provides an analysis of how we interpret uh, the Vasna uh, changes, because there's been a lot of debate of what do they actually mean? So if you're interested in that, uh, that's at the end of the report. Um, with that, um, I'd like to open this up for Q&A um, and look forward to a and hopefully an interesting discussion. There will be mics, so if you could just um, raise your hand, mics will be coming, and um, if you could please first state your name and your affiliation and make sure it's a question. Thank you. I think, there you go. Thank you. Uh, Jim Berger from Washington Trade Daily. I just want to ask a question to, related to the, um, the last statement you made on Wassenaar. Um, who, who brought that to Wassenaar table to discuss? I, was it the Europeans? Or I assume it was in the U.S. So um, the language for the intrusion software uh, was, goes back to a proposal by the uh, UK government, um, mm -hmm. which now if you, the Vasna regime takes uh, quite a while to process new proposals. So it's been uh, 18 months prior to the actual change happening in December. Um, and the IP network surveillance system is, as far as we know, um, based on a proposal that was made by the French government. Mm -hmm. Uh, the 2013 National Defense Authorization Act, there was actually congressionally mandated language having to do with employing export controls for the, uh, to limit the foreign availability of 
what was deemed oh, okay. cyber weapons without necessarily a, a strong uh, definition of, of what that, that implied. And so there, there has been some concurrent regulation in the United States, or at least intent to regulate. And uh, to just briefly explain the process at Vasnar, once the proposal has been made by one country, you have a technical group that meets once a year um, and where essentially the technical experts come together, look at the language, refine the language, ultimately agree to a consensus language if they do, which then becomes um, put in front of diplomats at the plenary in December who then give a thumbs up or thumbs down. Um, and that's how the Vasna process works, which is also why it takes 12 to 18 months from the initial proposal to an actual uh, adoption. Joel Coulter with AUVSI, but also with a video company. I'm an entrepreneur. I uh, was part of the IPv6 transition team. Now that ICON is no longer their transitioning ownership of the internet to the global community. And I was part of the Tunis thing when China and Iran went into and everybody left with them and only one country stayed with the US. Um, part of the initial planning before the Arab Spring, because we rely too much on social media and didn't realize that putting things on YouTube to stimulate instability was not a good thing to do within Egypt. You know, when the Egyptian Google executive put all the burning things. But the question I have, given the fact that state capitalism, we're a liberal capitalistic society, <coughs> and other communities are state capitalistic, so for example, in northern Afghanistan, there's China and Germany. So the question is, it's all about culture when it comes to internet and how it's used. And the private sector is very interested in stability. Their core meaning of any private sector is stability. So my, is it should be a private-public partnership or a public-private partnership? It's a little philosophical, but you know, let me try. Um, I'm not, when I look at the, the private sector, I'm not sure that they're all interested in stability necessarily. I think there is too often a lack of consideration of the impact abroad of what is done uh, in a context closer to home. Um, so I think we must look much more broadly at how we're going to tackle this problem. I know this event is about export controls, but I've made a plea before for doing human rights impact assessments in the R&D phase of technological development, simply because engineers or hackers or other programmers, coders, are often focused very much on the possible or pushing the frontier of, of uh, development, which is very exciting and has created so many new opportunities. But if we do not anticipate uh, the unintended consequences, uh, we can, we can uh, have a lot of surprises. So just an example, um, there was, of course, concern about the potential impact of facial recognition software, but uh, there are also companies uh, who may think that they can uh, up their profits uh, with making it easier to tag your friends in a birthday picture. Um, had that been assessed uh, a little bit earlier on, I think it wouldn't have taken an expert to understand the impact of facial recognition software on Tahrir Square in Egypt, uh, where one picture could trace back people months, years, uh, and later to that location. Uh, Thankfully, there has been a civil society initiative to kind of counter this phenomenon, uh, which is developed by Witness, which uh, has worked with Google to create a face blurring tool to allow for the documentation of certain events without compromising the identities or making known the identities of, of people that, for example, are bystanders or are in the background or uh, whatever. So it's very much maybe action reaction is the appropriate word that we often see in the market, but that doesn't... Uh, what do you call it, uh, doesn't um, prevent or shouldn't prevent governments from taking their core responsibilities. And I think that's what we're talking about here. We're not talking about over-regulating the internet for the sake of regulating <coughs> the internet. I mean, uh, that should be no one's intention who cares about the economic, social uh, potential of, of the open internet. But uh, governments still have 
responsibilities both in the field of security and in the field of ensuring competition in the market, for example, or uh, in ensuring people's fundamental rights and freedoms are respected. And the reality is that decisions of companies here, and this country is particularly powerful when it comes to the digital economy, have an enormous impact in other places in the world. And I only wish that companies were interested in um, uh, in what the impact could be abroad, whether it leads to more or less stability. But I, I, I frankly think that thinking often, uh, often lacks of this global uh, context. And that is what I think we need uh, in order to make these policies work. So I think, I think towards that point, though, one of the things that you've seen, to speak to actually the first thing that Rebecca brought up, is that in the case of information technology companies, um, such as Google, such as Yahoo, what, in 2006 there was this movement based off of the Sure Tao case especially, that if we don't regulate ourselves or if we don't engage in sort of multi-stakeholder processes that at least remove this public pressure, the government is going to come down. In, in, if you look at these, tele these communications companies, such as, again, Google, there is a substantial ability for something like a consumer-facing boycott. There is a, a public brand that is damaged in, in violation of human rights or in bad press. If you take, however, something like Noros, uh, which is a subsidiary of Boeing. What are you going to boycott 777s because, because of Norris's activities? There is very little consumer-facing brand to hacking team. There is no consumer-facing brand. And so if we look at things like democratic participation or consumer, consumer action, there is very little interface. And so the amount, you know, what we've seen is, is tech people are, are extremely adverse to governmental regulation. You spoke to that point, and I, I think that we can address that if, if, if that's of, of any interest to people. So this is why people have, have grabbed at things. They've looked for this form of self-regulation. They've looked for this form of peer pressure. They've looked at uh, uh, court cases. But if you would look at, for example, the, the case of uh, the, the Chinese lawsuit having to do with their participation with the Great Firewall, a case in which uh, Cisco explicitly was aware that they were going to engage in activities uh, that would lead to the suppression of the Falun Gong, um, actually th there's been no opportunity for recourse. That case, the, the Cisco case was, was thrown out uh, last month, I believe. And if you look at this decision, actually one of the things that, that, that the judge said is, look, in the case of China, we have substantial export controls having to do with crime control technology. These are bipartisan consider, uh, considerations. We have, we have this existing regulation. But the fact that there is no regulation therefore implies that there's no intent to, uh, to, to regulate the, uh, the foreign availability of internet surveillance devices. And because it's not uh, the, 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 the judicial branch's domain to start making foreign policy decisions and export uh, decisions, there's no recourse here. And so again, you see this process in which the tech community, civil society, uh, human rights organizations uh, more broadly have interfaced with all of the different forms of, of control or self-control and export controls, in some ways, ends up being the, the, the least worse and, and most viable option. So let me, I mean, let me try and answer kind of the philosophical part of your question, which is, in a sense, it doesn't really matter what the nature of the business is, whether it's purely private or state-partnered or state-controlled. Rather, the, that in a way, business is neutral, and how it operates is really a reflection of what society expects of it. And that's true of environmental laws, it's true of anti-bribery laws, and it's true of these human rights issues. So take Ethiopia, for example, because we have this report on this problem coming out tomorrow. The problem of technology and how it was exported to Ethiopia and how it would be used was utterly predictable insofar as the government has set up a surveillance state where neighbors are supposed to spy on neighbors, where even aid is monitored and distributed according to your political affiliations. So the fact that a uh, telecom company like France Telecom or ZTE now can build up telephone infrastructure in the country should have come with the recognition that it was going to be used to spy on people, however beneficial increasing the network was in the country and is. 
right? And secondly, when a company like Gamma International, a German company, offered and sold the government Finn Fisher or hacking team did, they had to have known because Ethiopia's history was completely unambiguous that it would end up on the computers of people the government considered dissidents, right? So you look at this and you say, well, all the government is doing is adopting new technology to its old pattern of spying and surveilling and harassing people. So there are cases where people were detained because the phone numbers they dialed internationally on the mobile network were not already in the database the government had of phone numbers that people should or could have dialed, right? And so the way I look at that is say, look, if, if you look at this situation where it's utterly predictable and any reasonable degree of due diligence by a telecom company, an internet company, or more importantly, a company that sells surveillance software or surveillance products, would have told you where this might end up. And yet it was still sold, in part because there are no sanctions on it in the U.S. or anywhere else. And in fact, the Ethiopian government is a close ally of the U.S. and other Western governments. And because there are no rules in place to look at this and say, wait a minute, the odds are actually quite good that this will be used to go after dissidents or political opponents just as much as it might be used to engage in legitimate law enforcement activity. And therefore, there need to be some controls on it. So when I think of export controls, I think of it the same way we might think about about how lead in the environment or, or you know, anti-corruption is something that at one point was unregulated, but ultimately people realized the harms were greater than the benefits and got regulated. It didn't stop business, for example, but it did change the way business operates. Well, and Let me yeah. ask you a follow-up question. Oh. Are you arguing to put all the data under Google, or do you believe who owns the data matters and each country should have its own sovereignty of data? So well, I think I th it's a separate question, if but I, I mean, maybe if you want to... I just wanted to build, yeah, on, I think build on the other point that was made, because I think what we'll also increasingly see is a conf conflict of interest between different companies in the digital economy. Uh, and it will force companies also to take a more political role. Uh, they are they are put in a in a role that was previously usually only uh, decisions for governments to make. So, for example, when you look at the fallout of this clip uh, on so-called uh, quote unquote innocence of Muslims, uh, you know this was supposed to be a movie, but it was really kind of a patchy product that led to all kinds of uh, demonstrations, including uh, where where violence broke out and where people died. And there was a discussion uh, between the White House and the State Department on whether or not to apply pressure on Google to take down this information. Uh, there were different decisions by Google made in different countries uh, on whether or not to take down this information. Uh, and now uh, we see a whole discussion around American companies in Turkey, where uh, the government is uh, shutting down Twitter on the one hand, uh, where on the other hand, um, uh, Google is declining to take down some content while on the other hand having accepted to operate under Turkish law, which is already heavily restricting speech uh, in order to keep that market, which uh, I think is, is you know mostly a business interest. So I think... What is interesting is to see how companies like Twitter, uh, where the business model is really uh, to facilitate speech, um, uh, will speak out or not speak out against those companies who are selling surveillance technology, et cetera. I mean, this could be a part of how the business community uh, engages in this discussion is one that I believe is interesting. We should not forget in any case that there can be conflict of interest between American companies, and this also will feed into uh, decisions that the American government, for example, will make. And uh, if I can, uh, next question. I think what is, um, we mentioned, we talked about how there are different companies and how some can be pub subject to public pressure and others can't. The similar, a similar approach, I think, needs to be applied with regard to the technology because um, it's really hard to identify what kind of technology are we talking about, where is it being used, and for what purpose. Um, so that's where something that we, uh, Maricha and Colin have alluded to earlier, there is the experience of the crypto war and that there, crypto wars, and there's this fine line to walk of how can you make this so that it's narrowly crafted and not overly broad, but clearly um, in a much better state than we are currently in, because right now, as everybody has said, it's unregulated apart from a very few instances. And there's a very strong argument to, to be made that we have a new technology that has simply outpaced the rate that regulation has been able to be updated. Um, but um, with that, let's take a few more questions. Hi, uh, Josh Ettinger, AAAS. Um, 
So if a country implements regulatory controls or export controls, what is there to stop a private company from simply relocating or running their software through different channels, potentially secretive ones, to these countries? Um, nothing. But what I think may well happen, what I hope will happen, is that gradually a set of global norms will emerge, or at least uh, norms that um, open market economies or democracies will adopt. Uh, it depends who can be um, um, persuaded to, to join these norms. But right now, we're not even close to, to knowing what norms we're looking at. And, you know, there was a day where nobody thought the death penalty was a strange kind of punishment that went too far. And somebody started that discussion. And now, at least in the European Union, thankfully, uh, it is considered inhumane and it will never uh, be applied. Um, is it Hopefully, one day this country will also uh, be there. But I'm trying to say that you have to start somewhere. And of course, you will lose some market to others. Um, but we, we have real strategic interests, real uh, human rights concerns that are an integral part of our policies, our foreign policies, that we're now allowing to be compromised uh, by our own companies. And that credibility problem is real. Um, I mean, if you're trying to address a government uh, in foreign policy and saying, look, stop um, uh, closing uh, media outlets, stop censoring your people. And the same company knows that it's signing a contract whenever it wants with a company that's located in the same country. It, it, it really harms your credibility. And uh, then on top of that, of course, harms the lives of people and uh, uh, the strategic interest. But that problem needs to be addressed. And uh, uh, that's why I think uh, we're, we're seeking uh, smart regulations to make that happen. And, and if you, so I mean, just on that, if you look at, at other instances where this has been an issue, particularly anti-corruption and sanctions law generally, um, you see over time that once the first level of rules are implemented, then later you see culpability for that. I mean, look at the multi-billion dollar fines HSBC and others have paid. That it is exactly for this type of stuff, for subverting sanction through foreign subsidiaries and things like that. So yeah. you expect that once the first set of rules are in place, the second set will evolve to, to capture that problem as well. It won't solve everything, but it will start getting at that issue. Yeah. I'm glad you raised this question because I think it's uh, the, the effectiveness of the regime overall, and we've gotten this question uh, several times over the, uh, since we've been working on this. Um, something that we've noticed is a lot of times the question comes in, if, can you stop a single company from exporting a, s a specific item to another country? And there, there are arguments that this will be hard to enforce, but that's not what determines the effectiveness of the export control regime overall. Because yes, you might have the, f the f few black sheep that are not, that don't care about human rights, that will export a technology to a specific country and end users where from a human rights perspective, they should definitely not export it to. But as we've seen after the Arab uh, uprising, you had the archives opened up, you were able to find out what company had actually exported this technology. And right now we're in a state where n there was there's no law in place that would have actually allowed to sue a company and say, you should not have exported it to this country and to this end user. Now, if the laws become updated, and the export controls become updated to reflect this new technological reality, you actually have a legal basis to do that. And what changes then is, you might not be able to prevent the export of that single company, but you might, ac you might be able to find that company and through the fine create a deterrent effect yeah. that will create a shadow of the future for the rest of the regime and entice other companies to adhere to the regime. So it's not so much about the single export of a single company, it's much more about the effectiveness of the regime overall. And I think even, though, uh, even in that regard, Export of the control of export of technology can lead to effective regime because of those um, shadow of the future uh, effects. Yeah, and you can tie it with lots of other issues like procurement, like mm -hmm. development. I mean, there are when you can make it a conditionality also much more broadly, but you have to start somewhere. I mean, these are all implementable ideas. You could say to, uh, I don't know, but I'm sure the, the aid by the EU to a country like Ethiopia <coughs> is enormous. And you can say that's conditional upon and then a set of principles. Um, that is only possible if we know where the limit is. Uh, same with procurement. A lot of these companies are, are maybe also seeking government bids and tenders. Well, if you seek to violate um, a, a law in field A, then your products are not attractive anymore and potentially even uh, out of uh, out of line for a government tenders uh, on other lines of your business. So there are a lot of things we can do once we start 
uh, putting a norm uh, and a discussion somewhere and export controls are only one part of that I just want to emphasize uh, but but we right now lack transparency and regulation and accountability and so the starting point has to be created although we're very much aware that it will be imperfect and of course uh, other players will take over the market but you know they can they can um, be accountable for their own foreign policies and their own practices, which, you know, we have to be for ours. So, so actually, to speak to one of those points, uh, as far as conditionality on, on contracts, we actually have that in the United States under the Comprehensive Iran Sanctions and Divestment Act, which debars, uh, debars uh, companies from, from having government tenders if they've been found to sold, uh, have sold uh, censorship or surveillance equipment to, to Iran. Um, but I also want to uh, sort of speak to this question of whether this is a futile venture because these things are portable. In fact, uh, I think that we have this notion of, of surveillance by software being a, a childish act that somebody can cross a border into Malta and to start to produce. Uh, in fact, I, I don't think that that's the case, and I don't think that's uh, the case, especially with the uh, the network devices uh, definition that was laid out under uh, under Vassenar. These are actually incredibly sophisticated piece of, uh, pieces of equipment that require substantial research and development, require substantial manufacturing investments, and, and also have sort of tied with them long-term support contracts. So, for example, Naros Insight, which is one of the most powerful, uh, powerful devices, again, this is a subsidiary of Boeing. A uh, subsidiary of Boeing is probably not going to start moving into third-party countries in order to circumvent export controls. I should hope not, and I should hope that our, our, our uh, export control regime should be able to, to handle these sorts of things. <coughs> there might also be additional re recourse um, through, through mechanisms that exist in the United States, but not in Europe. Uh, such as notions of deemed exports, but I also know there are, are export control lawyers in the room, and I'm really afraid of them, uh, so I'm not going to venture into that. Uh, and so, and so, I think it's important to, to say that there is a, a friend of mine likes to make the difference between efficient versus sophisticated, and so you can you can divide you can you can sort of craft a a uh, malware interception kit or a network censorship kit that is that is effective because you're able to block all content. Actually, internet filtering is incredibly simple, and I could teach you like within a week how to filter the entirety of, of Syria. But what, what uh, foreign countries get is they get, they get sophisticated. They get, you aren't just going to uh, be able to compromise this person or filter this person. They're, they're getting, you can compromise any person out there and we're going to guarantee one, uh, nearly 100% of the time that you're going to gain access or be able to disrupt access. And so this is the differentiation. The thing that is of most substantial concern when you start getting into uh, sophisticated tracking, correlational analysis. These are, these are intensive technologies that require investment that is not just portable against borders and not just something that you do in your sort of startup, uh, you know, garage type venture. Well, and oftentimes, just to add to that, <clears throat> in terms of identifying the, the appropriate actors in this market, it often also uh, requires sharing of know-how. So teams of, of people going to third countries under difficult security circumstances, sitting there for a couple of months, you know, getting R&R &R on top of their salary. I mean, this is like not always difficult to trace what's going on. Uh, and we've seen companies that have come to terms with their own practices and found themselves caught in situations that they really didn't want to be in. We've been asked by companies to apply sanctions so that they could breach contract without being liable. It's not a joke. I mean, so I believe that we have to also make an appeal without just waiting for law to the, to the moral decisions that companies make. You know, there is a way to do this in a, in a more sort of appropriate, healthy way <clears throat> instead of at, at the cost of people's lives. I mean, really, I think that's also something we have to do. And that's why a public debate is so important, even though these are complicated technical issues. I mean, it, it really actually astonishes me that this has not erupted much more vividly as a debate in light of the NSA revelations, uh, in light of everything that's happening. Because, of course, clearly there's another kind of uh, problem here. And that is, I think, the 
arrogance of some governments or some companies to think that they're always going to be uh, the front runners in this market and that there will never be anyone faster uh, to to apply these technologies against them. In other words, the proliferation of these technologies. There's a real illusion also found in my own country that uh, we're always going to be the fastest in this in this place and that we can keep a grip, that governments can allegedly keep a grip on these technologies. And, uh, you know, even James Clapper said that U.S. interests have been violated with lawful intercept technologies that have been exported from the United States. So these things come back as a boomerang and companies should rethink their interests very seriously. And, and just one point on why this is a regulatory issue is if you look at Syria, Libya, Ethiopia and elsewhere, if you're seeing the same half dozen or less companies have the same problem in multiple jurisdictions, then you probably have a regulatory problem. Yep. Um, so, I mean, <laughs> it's point. just... So I have Mike here up front and Sasha. Uh, some of the uh, questions I would have asked have been touched on, but I want to ask one about... Uh, we, we've talked, uh, I think, uh, we've talked about aiming at the sort of software arms dealers, the particular companies that are providing technologies that are not generally available and they're selling particularly to governments and they're, and they're moving to every new government uh, as they work under the Malthusian pressure of trying to find a market for their product. But the interesting question that remains to me are companies that are providing communications infrastructure itself. Because as, you know, as, as, as European countries know, as the United States uh, uh, grapples with from time to time, uh, telephone companies themselves and infrastructure providers themselves are mandated by their governments to put uh, s various kinds of surveillance uh, technologies into, uh, into what they offer. So if you take a country like uh, South Sudan or, or Burma where uh, foreign companies are being invited in not <coughs> to provide surveillance software but to provide communications infrastructure itself, which will typically be heavily mobile based, which will typically be heavily digital in various ways or have various digital layers. Uh, what can we do to make sure that those companies which have the technology already, uh, the, whether they're European companies or Australia or the United States that have the technology already to build surveillance capabilities into the communications infrastructures of developing company, countries uh, uh, do not uh, in effect facilitate the kind of surveillance uh, uh, and uh, human rights abuses that we've, we're talking about here. So it's, it's ironic you mentioned Burma since we did a report on this uh, last year. And, and I think, I mean, you're, you're touching on the most, one of the most complicated areas because this, this comes at the heart of wanting to promote the spread of technology, but some technologies have, uh, can be inherently problematic depending on who's using them. And, and so take the case of Burma. I mean, what we said to the telecom companies like Telenor, who is there, Right, is that you need to do, there, there, there are two basic things you will need to do. One is to do diligence on your own operations and activities, and two is to understand that the current telecom laws are wholly set up to surveil, right? And until there's real reform of the telecom laws, you are going to run into trouble. So it's a twofold process of both being responsible as a company, but also understanding the regulatory regime you're walking into. And even though the government is opening up, it is not revising or reforming laws fast enough to keep up with certain sectors to, to respect rights. So there are two issues. As a general matter, um, what we kn did not know in, say, 2006, when the telecom infrastructure of Ethiopia was first being developed, that we do know in 2014 is that there should be a fundamental obligation for due diligence across sectors that, at a minimum, know the risk you're walking into and do things to mitigate them. Um, in telecoms, it's a lot harder because government has over arching control of the of the sector more so than maybe an in internet but there's still things you can do and a good example is what happened to Vodafone in Egypt and elsewhere where by failing to do that due diligence they couldn't push back on overbroad requests by the Egyptian government and other things they they may not have prevented everything that happened but they could limit it and one of the things we're seeing particularly in mobile telecommunications around the world is a regular pattern of governments of what they are trying to do so what you see in domestic uprisings or protests or anything else you see cutting off text 
and mobile phones in the direct area where protests are occurring, which also could mean, and this is a real problem, cutting off of emergency services. So as people might be getting injured for demonstrating or exercising their right to free expression, they're also losing access to emergency services, 911 and things like that, that could actually help them. Right, right. And then or you're also, the too. you're also seeing, and this happened in Kazakhstan, where the co at least one of the companies uncritically went, took the government's request. They were told, cut off all the services, cut off text, cut off email, and cut off mobile communications in the area where protests were occurring, but tell everybody you're having technical difficulties. Um, so the second thing they can do is because often, particularly if you're a foreign subsidiary, notify the rest of the world of what's going on outside the country, right? So the biggest mistake they made is they didn't tell anybody this is what was going on. And even the company's headquarters didn't find out until after the country manager had already done it. So there are small but limited steps to build on what are the more complicated things. But it, in today's age, not doing the due diligence alone is, is a problematic problematic effect. Well, I think there we should also look at more anticipation. I mean, what we've learned from, for example, the case of Vodafone in Egypt, but also the case of Nokia Siemens networks in Iran, is that um, when a company is confronted with such a decision, it's stressful, it's understandable. I've talked to uh, people in these companies who, who, you know, share what they have learned from this. Of course, they're trying to defend the case, but, you know, uh, that's uh, understandable from their point of view. Um, but I think it could have made a difference if Vodafone would have been either in breach of European law, it's a UK company, one of the biggest telcos uh, in, in Europe, um, or if it would have had uh, simple and fast access to high-level government officials to get their backing in, in declining this order, for example. So we can also anticipate that these cases will happen more and more often. And, and somebody, I forget who, but mentioned uh, the case of South Sudan. Uh, yeah, sorry, you. When when a new government is going to uh, be um, established or after a transition, let us prioritize these issues more swiftly. Let us immediately ad address this problem and, and understand it to be as instrumental to the rule of law as free and fair elections, for example. Um, you know, in, in South Sudan, there was probably already a surveillance net before the first blogger had been able to put some words, uh, words down. And... Um, I think we can also do things like work with, with regulators uh, who, can, who can share their know-how about how the system works. R telecom regulations are often not the priority for the United States or the EU in foreign policy when looking at transition. It is much more you know, good governance, human <coughs> rights, in a broader sense, a more abstract sense, and it's not very precise. And I think if we get this anticipation built into our own thinking and send the right players forward and uh, reduce the distance between corporate actors in this space and governments and understand that some of the issues are of common concern that we can also improve without even needing to change the laws necessarily. I, I, hope, that's right. I hope that's right. I think in Burma we know that the input on the telecom regulation as they're setting up uh, their, the regulator and as they're letting foreign entrance in uh, the, the primary drafters of the regs have been the phone companies themselves, uh, yeah. and, and not necessarily you know, uh, human rights oriented, at least. No, I agree. Mm -hmm. That's a problem. So, I mean, just, just on that, I mean, just building on that, there are a couple of things. One is some of the telecom companies are already starting to deal with this kind of systemically with the Global Network Initiative and in a dialogue with that, which, which could be positive. Secondly, there are other actors involved. So, for example, the World Bank is promoting telecom liberalization around the world, which, which is neither here nor there from a human rights standpoint, but it's problematic if they don't put in adequate due diligence requirements as they provide money to governments to liberalize those sectors. Mm -hmm. And then third, I mean, if you want to see where due diligence and not doing things in the telecom sector can go the worst, look at 2006 when the U.S. telecom companies argued for retroactive immunity in the, in the revisions to the FISA regulations and everything else, and you get a surveillance infrastructure like we have today globally, right? So there are plenty of lessons on why to do things different, and, and this may be an opportunity to do that. Sasha. Hello. Uh, I'm Sasha Meinrath. I'm the director of the soon to publicly launch XLab program here at New America. And I know we're in DC, so I want to 
ask sort of maybe a more provocative question. So let's take all political pragmatics and stick them aside for just a moment, and we'll make you all the hyper non-paradoxical human rights dictators of the globe. And the question is this, which is, if you could do anything with all political economics aside and all of the, the limitations to what's possible aside, what would be the top one, two, maybe three things that you would start with to create the kind of ethical or moral framework around these issues? I'd like to get sort of the high level, here's what we should be doing so that we can see what filters out at the end of one's political pragmatics and what have you are put into the mix. So my temptation is to say I would have some being up here as a 50-foot waterfall speaking <laughs> out about what the telecom industry should do if I could do anything I wanted. But, but I mean, I actually think the norms are there. Um, so it's, it, you know, they're, they're basically, I mean, in an, in an ideal world, you can have completely open technology to where, as of this minute, nothing is censored and, you know, everybody has privacy rights, right? But, but as a practical matter, the normative framework exists, whether you look at something like the UN Guiding Principles on Business and Human Rights, GNI, or, or, or any analytical framework, it's there, and it's just a question of finding a way to adapt them to, to the realities that institutions are facing. So I, I don't think, I mean, from a normative standpoint, it's not that, that big a lift. It's the, the challenge is putting that into technical practice, I think. Uh. Yeah, there are lots of things that should be done, I think, but um, we, we should not underestimate the importance of this country and lawmakers in this country and uh, the difference they can make. And I'm concerned about the intertwining of business interests and politics in this country. It makes it very, very difficult um, to find people that are that are mostly going to be held accountable for what they do for the public cause, let alone the global public good, right? I mean, that's just, uh, that's difficult. But um, by increasing the liability of violators, let me just put it that way, liability for violators, sorry, making it more difficult or more costly or um, uh, bad for business to um, engage in these activities, whether it is um, through export controls, which is still, it's both preventive, but also allows for um, reaction. Um, that's one option. I think it is really important. I mean, in the scheme of things, it's really important. Uh, but also these human rights impact assessments. Some of the problems we're facing have potential technological solutions, and they should be incentivized, invested in, required. Uh, and they're, in my opinion, very much two sides of the same coin. Uh, but if you don't identify explicitly what the problem is, then it's more difficult to also find a solution. And if we can do this with, with as few laws as possible, that would be great. Uh, so I think the business community itself can come up with competing um, solutions. Uh, those would be some of my uh, thoughts about it. This is an XLab question, isn't it? <laughs> That's what it means. Um, so I think, I think the first thing, and to start off in a constructive note, uh, I would push for further liberalization of, of encryption controls and, uh, and incentivize further adoption so that encryption is ubiquitous and, and the norm on the internet. Um, there is two strains uh, as far as my second uh, option of my wish, uh, because the, the activist in me uh, wants to say we should have, uh, we should borrow substantially from the crime control uh, classifications within the U.S. export regime, which would incur substantial liabilities. I think that we should have stronger, uh, that, that the things that have been done to the alien torts statute uh, and that have removed standing for these sorts of human rights violations is incredibly non-constructive. Uh, and so I would, I would, throw everything as, as much as possible to create liabilities and to create due diligence standards uh, in order to export certain types of devices. The pragmatist in me and the empathetic person in, in me uh, also realizes, though, that 
there are these muddled issues having to do with, for example, lawful interception devices, and recognizes that this is, this is a substantial structural difficulty in which if there was overregulation, we could quite honestly do uh, significant damage to our ability to improve networks. We see this, for example, uh, you know, in Iran. Uh, Iran mandates 128k second connections by parliamentary proceedings. The assumption is, is the reason why is they can't censor fast enough. And so this creates this difficulty of if we want faster internet, they are fully willing to just repress their, their population's ability to access the internet because they don't have control over that process. And so I recognize, and I think that we should recognize, that there is a contention where we might have to deal with the fact that we w might facilitate better surveillance and better control by giving better technology. And so this is the empathetic part of me, which, uh, which wants to, which hopes the process for these sorts of regulations is, is deliber deliberative and in, engages in an honest conversation with vendors who have honest grievances and incorporates these sorts of, uh, uh, these sorts of very legitimate concerns. I mean, not to be, I mean, I was being glib before, but there is one element that, that has to be part of it too, and that's real independent oversight. Because mm -hmm. every system breaks down, yes. particularly in this area, because it's inherently secret without oversight. And that's not just of the public sector, but of the private sector as well. So if that element isn't there, then all the other things fall apart too. And that's why an Ethiopia or a Syria or a Libya is particularly placed to misuse technology, because nobody's really going to stop stop the entities from doing it. So we have uh, 10 more minutes. If you have more questions, please uh, think of them. I will ask Arvin uh, one question, and I would like to uh, let the other two panelists know. Um, ah, yeah, Mark. Um, I will ask you for concluding remarks at the end, or if you have yeah. anything to share. But before that, uh, Marty, in the, in the back. You've talked a bunch of times about uh, the need for regulations and due diligence, and I'd like to get the panel's reaction or their forecasts about where are the likely hang-ups or bright spots uh, as these regulatory instruments start to unfold as some of this gets implemented. I mean, as I look at this, we have a very complicated cross-national coordination problem to try to harmonize. I mean, yes, there's some unilateral payoff, non-hypocritical foreign policy. We might get lucky. That would be great. Uh, <coughs> but even then, within states, there are the, uh, and, um, and we've heard also about uh, EU harmonization of regulations as being an interesting cross-national problem. But then, as I look inside these individual national bureaucracies, the regulatory scene is frightening. I mean, it's not entirely clear how all of these things are going to work their way through a regulatory apparatus and come out in these happy ideal places that we were just speaking of. So uh, are there places that would be good places to, car uh, to concentrate effort because these look like the bright spots on the regulatory landscape? Are there uh, pits of despair that we should be concerned about that will likely be uh, tar pits for certain kinds of regulatory efforts we might launch? So maybe I'll start uh, with this one first because it relates to the report um, where the new controls that were adopted at Varsna, um, in our view, presents a window of opportunity to take the two controls, especially the IP network su surveillance systems one, which is very narrow, narrowly tailored uh, and has a lot of ands in their uh, relationships and not ors, um, as well as the intrusion software language, um, to implement that uh, with a strong human rights component and to see how this will be implemented and what the lessons learned from that will be. Um, it's a very clear-cut case, and it could provide the blueprint for um, including additional technology that we know are of concern that are currently not subject to uh, the regulation. Uh, but the more you broaden that bucket, the, the, the more difficult it will become to draw the line between that dual-use character of the technology. Um, and in terms of the uh, um, something to, I think that we talked about before the event, the government, I think, is uh, facing a similar challenge than many human rights groups in terms of the, all of this new technology requires a lot more tech expertise in the bureaucracies as well as in, as in NGOs, and there's an increasing demand. And as this demand is put on the government from the outside to reform these regulations, 
it will be uh, easy for bureaucracy that does not have additional capacity and resources to, to address this um, to not spend the amount of time that's required to implement this in a sufficient way. I think here the Department of Commerce and BIS has these resources, they have technical experts, but the question is how much more has their demand increased over the, in recent years and how do we need to change bureaucracy to keep up with that? Um, that's. I mean, I mean, I think there, there are two areas that I, I think there, I mean, there is going to be opportunities to, to, to regulate the worst of the worst of the most dangerous technologies. I don't think, I, because I don't think people disagree with the fact these are problematic. But the second issue has to do with a broader trend that's happening in, in Europe and the United States, which is in various bits and pieces, due diligence is being regulated. So if you look at the Burma regulations that mandate some due diligence requirements for investments over half a million dollars, they're there. Um, if you look at Dodd-Frank 1502 and conflict minerals, they're there as well. The European Union is, is, is proposing new you know, disclosure requirements and looking at, at conflict minerals. So we're seeing a pattern in Western governments to start enshrining the principle of due diligence. What you're not seeing yet is a penalty for not doing anything about it, you're seeing a penalty of sorts for not disclosing. Um, so I see this as an evolution of where things are going. So you will see more and more of this. It won't be easy and it will be very hotly contested as it is in the US and elsewhere, but that's the trajectory of things. So you could see over time this becoming more and more the norm rather than, than an anomaly of anyone. So, so two more questions, uh, one Ross and then a second just before. I'm George Lyle from Internews. Uh, there's two questions I wanted to ask. Hopefully they'll be pretty short. Uh, one is uh, I wanted to get your all's <coughs> opinions on where you draw the line between lawful intercept, unlawful intercept, and intelligence gathering. Because it might seem, you know, just to play the devil's advocate, that from some of these countries' perspectives, uh, they would like to do some of the things that the U.S. is able to do. But uh, for various reasons, the European governments and the U.S. government doesn't want to allow them to do that. And... <coughs> Actually, the second question slips from my mind, so we'll just go with the first one. I don't know, who says that they're not already doing that? And what I mean is I want to know where your opinions are on where the line is drawn between lawful interception, unlawful interception, and intelligence gathering. Because lawful interception and intelligence gathering is something that we presume that all countries have the right to do. But from these discussions that I've attended from time to time, it seems as if there are certain countries we want to do those and certain countries that we don't. Oh, I'm sure that's true also. Um, no, I think the criterion for lawful intercept is that it is um, uh, of, a, of someone who, has, uh, who is um, of legitimate concern so that there is um, suspicion against him or her and not blanket, and that it is after a court order uh, and a um, review by a judge or uh, what do you call it, police... Uh, police investigator, what do you call it in the United States? It has somewhat different name, but in any way, the appropriate authority which reviews the case and authorizes for a limited period of time, uh, where um, uh, there is also um, uh, checks and balances on, uh, the, the indiv on the individual's case, you know, protecting the person from the state. And I think that that notion of protecting the individual from the state is more built into the culture in Europe or appreciation among the population because in the very recent history we had uh, the Stasi spying on, on uh, Germans. Eastern Europeans feel this very, very strongly uh, because of their experience in the Soviet Union. So it's about um, um, innocence until proven guilty, so really targeted at individuals where there's a legitimate concern or suspicion after review of the appropriate authorities for a limited period of time. That's in a criminal investigation. Uh, as far as the intelligence uh, gathering, I think there's a very um, uh, important discussion to be held about the appropriate oversight uh, and the uh, limits within which uh, these services can operate. And clearly, uh, you cannot have that discussion if the mandate is secret, the courts are secret, the laws are secret. I mean, there, then there is no such thing as oversight. Uh, and I'll come back to that in my, in my final remarks. I think these very core principles of what it means to be a democracy have to be reassessed and redefined in the context of 
these technologies that so easily allow for um, mass information gathering, mass surveillance. And I think the question is really whether mass surveillance can ever be in line with respect for human rights. Where's the proportionality in mass surveillance? So we can really draw upon the fundamental principles of the rule of law and of the um, uh, democratic states that at least uh, we live in, uh, allegedly, and uh, uh, seek to perfect them seek to perfect them uh, in light of what, what has been revealed recently. Uh, and I think that, you know, whether you see this as a crisis or whether you see this as uh, an opportunity, this is the moment to do it and to get it right. One last question, Ross. Each of you have talked about uh, surveillance technologies as though we all understand exactly what that means. Um, and, and I'd like to um, have a, a more detailed understanding of what you believe ought to be controlled that is not controlled for export today and why. Um, for example, um, are the new controls on surveillance systems adopted by Vassenaar last year adequate? Or are there other technologies which should be subject to similar requirements? And if so, what are they? So I think, I think actually the report does a pretty good job um, and I think that I think what we were surprised at was the extent to which uh, the Vassenaar changes were actually very technically precise, and we feel constructive towards these ends. Uh, Privacy International has has maintained a working list of potential other technologies. I don't know if it was included in any form in this, um, and I I can't recall offhand. Uh, what exactly constitutes that list other than things having to do with, for example, uh, mass uh, voice recognition. Uh, one of the things I, I want to backtrack and say is that uh, the United States m maintains uh, unilateral controls on crime control technology, uh, communications intercepting devices. And so uh, I think both some of the recommendations of PI and the re recommendations that might come under the report are things that are already regulated in the United States but are not put under Vassenaar or any multilateral controls. Uh, so I, I, I think just to, to sort of reiterate, I think that the definition of IP network surveillance systems is as adequate as we could expect. I think that uh, what, is, what will be interesting and necessary for any sort of future changes is to look at to how these are implemented and then how uh, bodies such as the technical advisory committees of, of BIS uh, sort of play a role in making sure that these keep up to, to the evolving standards. One of the things, of course, that we should be concerned about is if we put a number if we put a throughput rate, what does that throughput rate, rate mean in five years from now? This is, this is a substantial concern. And so how we shift these to meet the ever-evolving threat or ever-evolving concern or even ever-evolving pragmatic decision, decision to just abandon that, that low of a control, I think, I think needs to happen before we start throwing other things at, at Vassenaar. Uh, to just add to what Khan said, so we uh, have been looking at this list and uh, because we are very concerned about making sure that the language that we uh, propose and include in any report is v very uh, revised and well-crafted, we decided not to include it yet for this report. We wanted to make sure that this is, is out now because of the ongoing implementation of the Vasnar uh, changes and to provide a blueprint of what are the precedents with regard to human rights and existing ECCNs that focus on this uh, du dual-use technology that's already covered. Um, but we uh, are working on that and um, yeah we can talk more about that offline not yet in a public uh, setting um, but we are running out of time so with that I want to give everybody a chance for some final comments why don't we start with Colin oh I'm the least prepared I, I think actually everything that uh, that I've wanted to say has has been said I think that this is an interesting second engagement based off of the MC uh, the MC rules last year. I think that this is an, an interesting second engagement that warrants both the involvement of civil society as well as the professional uh, uh, sector in these processes in which especially civil society hasn't been previously engaged in. I don't think that enough of us go to, for example, the, the technical advisory committees 
uh, that, that Biz so happily maintains. Um, and I, I think that I think that successful implementation and and the use of export controls as a platform to impose due diligence on processes that have been seemingly uh, decisions have been that have been seemingly made in a vacuum. I think I think the success of that is going to be critical based off of civil society participation and stronger sort of consultation between civil society and private interests. And so I, I think I go into this hopeful that like like we said like Rebecca said that this is a maturing process uh, that is going to that is going to come to fruition and I, I think I'll just end on that um, I think the whole the whole reason why we're looking at regulation even though as a classical liberal not to be mistaken for the American uh, connotation to the word liberal I'm in, not in favor of overregulating but I think that we are at a point where we cannot practice what we preach not even uh, close uh, if we look at the technical abilities that are developing so fast and uh, the regulatory vacuum that we're facing and with every kind of measure that we're taking, whether it is around export controls or whether it is about um, uh, redefining the relationship between the individual and his government or uh, the services he or she uses online, um, we have to begin to build global norms and principles that we aspire to, understanding that uh, these will not be accepted and adopted by everyone uh, immediately. Um, uh, and for, for that to happen, we have to assess the global impact of what we may do in one context and how it may play out in another. Uh, I think we have to uh, reassess our own standards in that sense, but also seek uh, to develop standards and technological solutions that better respect people's human rights um, and empower the individual. And it's necessary uh, for, for maintaining and, and increasing our own credibility on a policy level to protect the very principles that governments are still required to do despite all the changes that technologies bring, which is to ensure security, to protect people's fundamental rights, uh, as well as uh, things like competition in the market. And so um, uh, I think there is a very solid case for, for looking at export controls as one of the ways uh, to, to um, have relevant policies in place uh, in a hyper-connected environment. I mean, I, you know, I, I look back and I think um, going back to 2006 and now eight years later, uh, whether it's NGOs or companies or government, we, we've increasingly understood the multifaceted impacts that ICT technology has on human rights, both positive and negative. And now what you're seeing that even was not the case a year and a half or two years ago is an understanding that some things need to be dealt with in a certain way, like export controls for certain types of technologies, and other things need to be dealt with in other ways, whether it's corporate conduct or greater oversight of the NSA or other governments or the like. And as we, we realize both the potential and the pitfalls of, of the technologies, this is an example of now we're getting a much more sophisticated and, and better understanding of how to deal with it. And hopefully what the export controls debate show, will show ultimately is how, how, how you can still harness the promise of technology while, while taking off some of its sharpest edges um, as well. And I think that's an evolving debate that's only getting going faster in, re in light of what's happened in the last year even. With that, I thank all of you for coming today. Uh, I thank especially the panelists and Rebecca uh, for joining us. If you uh, are interested, continue to be interested in this topic, uh, make sure to read the Human Rights Watch report that will come out tomorrow. And if you're interested specifically with regard in the US context, please uh, come uh, and uh, reach out to us later. Uh, the Vasner changes are an opportunity to uh, effect change in this regard and to make uh, at least some tiny steps. And uh, with that, hopefully see you soon. Thank you. Thanks, Tim.